Well, as you first come into the Croatian Museum, there's going to be a sense of, you know, this is, this is something really big, this is something awe-inspiring and some, something great here. We can answer the questions of the skeptics that attack the Bible's history. You know, we, we admit that we start from the Bible here to teach them how to think. Learn to circumnavigate or go around the person's intellect. <laughs>Now, I spent all day at the zoo once getting a picture of the rear end of an elephant. There we are. Uh, in fact, let me just focus upon that. There it is right there. Looks like a cedar tree to me. Does it look like a cedar tree to you? Behold, behemoth. I don't think so. Well, there's, are there some specific references to dinosaurs in the Bible, specific kinds? Well, I think there are. If we take a look in Job chapter 40, starting with verse 15, we read about a creature called behemoth. It's the Hebrew word behemoth, beast, beast of beasts. And it just, it, it, if you read the description of it, it sounds an awful lot like a sauropod dinosaur, one of the dinosaurs that had the very long neck and long tail and broad body, four legs. Look now at behemoth, which I made along with you. He eats grass like an ox. See now his strength is in his hips and his power is in his stomach muscles. You know, that's a really good description of a, of a diplonicus. The name Diplodocus means double beam, referring to the long muscles along its belly to support its very long neck and very long tail. Verse 17, he moves his tail like a cedar. That's a tree. He's got a tail like a, like a cedar tree. Really amazing. Uh, verse 18, his bones are like beams of bronze, his ribs like bars of iron. He's the first of the ways of God. Only he who made him can bring near his sword. Only God could attack this creature. That's how powerful it is. That's how impressive it is. Now, a lot of people have said, well, you know what? Behemoth really can't be a dinosaur. And, they, and I find that they say that not because the description doesn't fit, but because of their preconception that people and dinosaurs didn't live together, and therefore Job couldn't possibly have seen a dinosaur. And therefore they'll say things like, well, behemoth probably is just an elephant. But if you read the description, does it really fit the description of an elephant? Not really. Does an elephant have a tail like a cedar tree? Not at all. An elephant has a tail like a little rope, not a tail like a cedar tree. It doesn't fit. It doesn't fit. 
I can't prove to you that behemoth is a dinosaur, but I can prove to you it's not an elephant because the description doesn't fit. And it's unfortunate. A lot of Bibles actually, in the, in the footnotes, they'll say things like, you know, behemoth, have a little footnote, possibly an elephant or hippopotamus. But folks, something to remember, the footnotes in your Bible are not inspired. <laughs> something to remember. It's the text that's inspired. It's clearly not an elephant or hippopotamus. They don't have a tail like a cedar tree. He moveth his tail like a cedar. Wait a minute. His tail's like a cedar tree? Have you ever seen an elephant's tail? <laughs> not like a cedar tree. Mm -hmm. Have you ever seen a hippo tail? Not like a cedar tree. You know, before they put those comments at the bottom of the Bible, they really should be required to read the passage at least once. You know, before they comment on it. <laughs> it's not an elephant hippo. Hello? Uh, it's not one of those. Anyway. And you know, there's even indication in the Bible of a dinosaur that lived beside a man after the flood. Go and read the book of Job, Job chapter 40, verse 15. For him, the largest land animal God made, the description fits something like a sauropod dinosaur living with Job after the flood. Is there any evidence of any creature like a dinosaur in Scripture? Actually, there is. In the book of Job, chapter 40, beginning in verse 15, Behold now behemoth which I made with thee. He eateth grass as an ox. Lo, now his strength is in his loins. His force is in the navel of his belly. He moveth his tail like a cedar. The sinews of his stones are wrapped together. His bones are as strong pieces of brass. His bones are like bars of iron. He is chief of the ways of God. He that made him can make his sword to approach unto him. Now that's obviously a hamster. <laughs> Weasel? Gerbil? Is that a big creature or a little creature? I mean, to be chief of the ways of God, you got to be the man. But see, I've still got a problem because some people really don't know exactly how to interpret this. And I want to ask you a question. How many people use a study Bible? I, I love my study Bible. It's got lots of cool stuff in it. But you know, there are kind of problems with study Bibles, and I want to kind of show you how it works. You see, study Bibles have got this line here. Now, I want you to repeat after me. Above the line is God. Below the line is man. Above the line is Below the line is You're very trainable for this late at night. That's very good. You can stop now. The reason I say that is because sometimes the notes don't exactly match the text. Because in the NIV study Bible, the creature we just read about is described as possibly the hippopotamus or the elephant. Now, I've got a little bit of a problem with that. Anybody been to the zoo lately? You ever seen an elephant walking away from you? Does that look like a cedar to you? In Tennessee, we say that's a pretty sorry cedar. Or even that, somehow I'm just not really convinced about that. And if you think the hippopotamus may fit the bill, let's just see. Uh, nah. See, I just don't see that that works somehow. That's got to be a big creature. To be chief of the ways of God, you got to be the man. Maybe something like this, perhaps. I won't be dogmatic about that, but that's a very impressive creature. I don't think you could make a case for hippopotamus or elephant. I don't care what the study notes say. Some study Bibles say alligator or crocodile. Again, not very impressive. Maybe something like this. Look, here's a tail to me that looks like a cedar tree. Let's back it onto an elephant and say, I don't think. <laughs> How about we back it onto a, a hippo? No, I don't think so. Hey, why couldn't behemoth be a dinosaur? Why not? Well, dinosaurs lived millions of years ago. Excuse me, were you there? But it describes a dinosaur in Job uh, chapter 40. You get this chapter and give it to young children and get them to draw the type of thing that is being described here with the, the huge... Uh, um, legs and the huge, huge body and the tail like a cedar tree. They will come up something, look, uh, with a drawing something like a dinosaur. And you know, this is another thing. For years and years and years, depictions of dinosaurs, they were like, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the sheep with their tails dragging behind them in the, in the fairy story and in the nursery rhymes. But now you go to museums and you see them, they, they, their tails are put so that they're uh, sticking out behind them. And this is because there is now, they realize the balance between the, the neck of, and the head of the dinosaur and the tail. And as they walked along, they would do this. 
Notice what verses all of these presentations include. They all include verses 15 through 19. Why is it that Ken Ham and the Answers in Genesis organization, along with other young earth teachers, never continue with the remaining verses in Job 40 that describe Bohemoth? In this video, we are going to show why the remaining verses are left out. There is also a group called Restoring Genesis that produced a series of videos called Forbidden History, Dinosaurs, and the Bible. The young narrator in this video series makes numerous false claims and consistently states as fact things that cannot be substantiated by science or the Bible. He uses many of the same talking points as Ken Ham and Kent Hovind. And the final word that we find in the Bible that gives reference to the dinosaurs is behemoth. Behemoth is mentioned only once in the Bible, in the book of Job, which was written about 3,500 years ago. The description that it gives is very detailed, and when compared to known animals, reveals some interesting results. The book of Job is about a good and just man who lost everything, including his family, his health, and all his possessions. Just about the only thing he had left was his life. In the process of contemplating all that had happened to him and being somewhat troubled about his situation, he questions God about his purposes in dealing with Job. God replies to Job, and in part of his reply, we find this fascinating statement. Behold now, behemoth, which I made with thee. He eateth grass as an ox. The Hebrew word behemoth means large quadruped. So this is a very large, four-legged animal that eats grass like an ox. The passage continues, Lo now, his strength is in his loins, and his force is in the navel of his belly. This creature is extremely strong, and it has a large belly. Some scholars say this creature is an elephant or a hippopotamus because of the above descriptions. Let's take a closer look. An elephant has a big belly, a hippopotamus has a big belly, but the class of dinosaurs called sauropods have the biggest bellies of all. The passage continues, He moveth his tail like a cedar, the sinews of his stones are wrapped together. Many Bible translations say, He moveth his tail like a cedar, the sinews of his thighs are tightly knit together. Now compare, is this like a cedar? What about this? Nope, not even close. No other animal around today has a tail like a cedar tree. This most likely was the creature that God was referring to in his encounter with Job. Now that's like a cedar. Here's the rest of the passage. His bones are as strong as brass. His bones are like bars of iron. He is the chief of the ways of God. He that made him can make his sword to approach unto him. This sounds like a very big, very tough creature which was the chief of all God's creatures. So here we are, back to this guy. The elephant and the hippo don't even come close to being the chief of God's creatures. Let's look at what these lecturers are telling their audiences about Bohemoth. Verse 15 tells us, Behold now Bohemoth, which I made with thee, he eateth grass as an ox. The Hebrew word Bohemoth used in this text simply means the largest of animals. The remains of the seropod dinosaur are the largest found in the fossil record. The elephant is the largest land animal living on this earth today. The elephant also eats grass as an ox. So far, the biblical description could fit both the seropod and the elephant. Verse 17 reads, He moveth his tail like a cedar, the sinews of his stones are wrapped together. Starting with this verse, Young Earth creationists begin to modify God's Word to fit their preconceived idea that this animal is a dinosaur. Young Earthers accuse Old Earth creationists of trying to fit preconceived ideas based on science into the biblical text, when in fact, they are the ones guilty of this practice. What does this verse say? It says, He moveth his tail like a cedar. The original Hebrew word for moveth is kofetz. It is an action verb, not a descriptive adjective. It is not describing what the tail looks like. It is describing the movement action of the tail. 
It means to bend or to sway. Yet young earth lecturers continue to modify this portion of scripture. It is always described as a huge tail that looks like a cedar tree. Its bones are big, its body is big, I mean everything about that creature is big and it has an enormous tail as well. If you read the description of it, it sounds an awful lot like a sauropod dinosaur, one of the dinosaurs that had the very long neck and long tail and broad body. Wait a minute, his tail's like a cedar tree? Have you ever seen an elephant's tail? <laughs> Not like a cedar tree. Mm -hmm. Have you ever seen a hippo tail? Not like a cedar tree. And he moves his tail like a cedar, an enormous tail. Does that look like a cedar to you? <laughs> In Tennessee, we say that's a pretty sorry cedar. <laughs> look, here's a tail to me that looks like a cedar tree. Let's back it onto an elephant and say, I don't think so. The name Diplodocus means double beam, referring to the long muscles along its belly to support its very long neck and very long tail. Verse 17, he moves his tail like a cedar. That's a tree. He's got a tail like a, like a cedar tree. Really amazing. Whether it is Ken Ham, Dr. Jason Lyle, or any of the other Answers in Genesis speakers, the exact same words are used. This is where I have a major problem with the Young Earth Movement. The Bible says nothing about a huge tail. And it has an enormous tail as well. One of the dinosaurs that had the very long neck and long tail. An enormous tail. To support its very long neck and very long tail. When Kent Hovind and Tommy Mitchell give their presentations, they show a graphic of verse 17. Instead of the emphasis being on the word moveth, the words his tail like a cedar is highlighted. The word moveth, the most important word in this verse, is ignored. Ken Ham shows cartoons of an elephant and a hippo with extremely long tapered tails, implying that the description of the tail in the Bible doesn't fit an elephant or hippopotamus. But Ken Ham has made another huge mistake by trying to fit his preconceived ideas into the Bible text. That mistake is his preconceived idea of the cedar tree being described in this verse. For argument's sake, Let's pretend that the scripture is giving a description of a cedar tree. It's not, but let's pretend it is. The young earth creationist perception of the cedar tree being mentioned in Job is not the cedar tree they are thinking of. There is only one type of cedar tree that fits the description Ken Ham gives in his lectures. The western red cedar native to the area of Montana in the United States, looks similar to the giant redwood sequoia trees of California. This has to be the cedar tree that Ken Ham is referring to. But this cedar tree is native only to the North American continent and a small area of Australia. This tree is not native to the Middle East, and there is no evidence that it ever has been. Ken Ham is using the description of a tree that didn't exist in Job's day where Job resided. The cedar tree mentioned in Job 40 is the Lebanese cedar tree, which still exists today and was common in the Middle East during Job's time. The Lebanese cedar tree consists of a long, wiry trunk with a clump of branches at the top. The wood consists of a flexible fiber causing the tree to sway in the breeze much more than any other tree in that area. An adult elephant's tail is, on an average, about six to eight feet long and weighs between 20 and 30 pounds, with a clump of wiry hair at the end that it uses to swat flies. When the elephant walks, the tail sways back and forth, strikingly similar to the movement of a Lebanese cedar tree swaying in the wind. The tail bends. Ken Ham has taken his own preconceived ideas about what Job is describing and tries to modify God's word to fit his ideas. Again, let's say that Ken Ham's interpretation of the description of the tail is correct. A seropod's tail doesn't look anything like a Lebanese cedar tree. In fact, if you put an elephant's tail next to a Lebanese cedar tree, you'll see more of a similarity between these two than what the young earthers are proposing. Remember, the Bible doesn't describe what the tail looks like. It describes the movement of the tail. But if it was describing what the tail looked like, 
It's describing a Lebanese cedar tree. Followers of the young earth creationist rely solely on the word of people like Ken Ham instead of researching for themselves whether the information they are receiving is accurate. They sit in one of the lecturers given by the Answers in Genesis staff, look at graphics shown of a seropod dinosaur's tail, and are misled into believing that God's word is saying the tail of behemoth looks like a cedar tree when the text says nothing of the sort. But even if it did, the tail of the elephant looks just like a Lebanese cedar tree. Along with this blatant misrepresentation, Young Earth lectures also imply that the creature has a long neck. The name Diplodocus means double beam, referring to the long muscles along its belly to support its very long neck and very long tail. I have dissected the original Hebrew text that describes this animal, and there is not one reference in scripture about the animal's neck. There are references to its loins, belly, tail, bones, mouth, and nose. There is absolutely no reference to the animal's neck. This omission in the Bible is probably because there is nothing that stands out about an elephant's neck. In fact, it hardly has one. Yet the Young Earth Movement continues to claim the animal has a long neck. This claim is totally unsubstantiated in Scripture. Again, who is taking their preconceived ideas and forcing them into the biblical text? Verse 18 is an excellent example of divine inspiration in the biblical text. When these words were penned, the writer probably did not even understand himself what he was writing, but God was inspiring the words. And when God describes the bones of Behemoth, he was describing elephant bones with clues that have just recently been discovered by science. Elephant bones are unique because of the size of their bodies. Normal bones would break under the weight of the massive bodies of these animals. So God designed the bones with two distinct properties, strength and flexibility. The bones need to be strong enough to support the weight, but flexible enough not to break when the animal is moving or running. Verse 18 reads, His bones are as strong pieces of brass, his bones are like bars of iron. Notice what this verse is saying. God is comparing Bohemus bones to two different types of metals. The word brass, translated from the original Hebrew text, is nikosha, which is actually copper. It is a soft metal that was refined by ancient Hebrews to be used in applications where bending or forming the metal was important. The next description of Bohemus bones is with the word barzel, this word is correctly translated as iron, a rigid, strong metal used in Job's time to make strong tools and nails. Once refined, this metal was rigid and hard, very difficult to bend. So why is this description so important when describing Bohemus bones? John Hutchinson, a biomechanics expert, an expert in elephant anatomy, just recently discovered something very unique about elephant bones. Elephants can run over 15 miles an hour. Their bones must be strong enough to avoid breaking at these impressive speeds. During an elephant autopsy, John Hutchinson found something unique about the properties of these elephant bones. John Hutchinson is an expert in animal locomotion he knows what makes elephant's bones so sturdy. Elephant bone is made of two kinds of materials. It's a composite. And we can do an interesting preparation here where we soak a normal mammalian bone in acid and remove the mineral component from the bone. And that's what we've done. What you'll see if I apply just a little bit of load to this bone is that it's remarkably compliant. It's remarkably bendy. In contrast, this is the same bone from a similar species, and bake it. Uh, really high temperatures, and that will remove the organic material, so we're just left with the mineral component of bone. And that bone is, is really, really brittle. Uh, and you can see right here, I can break it right away. So an elephant has a skeleton made of both flexible and rigid mineral and organic materials. Folks, this is the personification of divinely inspired scripture. Here is recent scientific evidence 
proving not only that the book of Job is divinely inspired, but that Job chapter 40 and verse 18 is describing the bones of the largest land animal alive during Job's day, the elephant. But again, the Young Earth Lectures are misrepresenting what God's Word says in this verse. In their presentations, they proclaim facts that are not given in God's Word concerning the size of Bohemus bones. The Bible says, his bones are as strong pieces of brass. His bones are like bars of iron. He had big bones. And they did. I've got one here on the table. This is a copy of a toe bone from a brachiosaur. Now, kids, this is going to be complicated, so listen carefully. The reason he had such big toe bones is because he had big toes. The Bible says nothing about the size of the bones. The verse is describing the properties of the bones. Yet the young earth audiences are made to believe that the verse is describing the bones of a huge dinosaur. And while we're on the subject of large animals, let's examine the next verse. He is the chief in the ways of God. He that made him can make his sword to approach unto him. The original Hebrew word for chief is reshith, and it simply means first in rank. In the context of this verse, it means the largest of land animals. Young Earth creationists claim that this is the seropod dinosaur, which is the largest extinct animal in the fossil record. But the elephant is the largest land animal alive today. And we're going to show why the elephant is the animal being described in Job chapter 40. I'll give Ken Ham and the rest of the Young Earth creationists the benefit of the doubt up to this point that they simply have a lack of knowledge when it comes to what the Bible is actually telling us about Bohemoth. I'll concede the possibility that young earthers don't know that the giant cedar tree never existed in Job's environment. I'll give them a pass on their incorrect assumption that the Bible mentions a long neck when it doesn't. There's a good chance that they have never heard of the recent scientific evidence of the two properties of elephant bones that substantiates the description given in verse 18. But here is where I believe the deliberate deception begins to take place. In every one of the presentations given by any of the lecturers from Answers in Genesis, the description always ends at verse 19. Every one of the Answers in Genesis staff abruptly in their interpretation of God's Word at verse 19. But the description continues through verse 24. So why would anyone decide to omit verses 20 through 24? By examining what these verses say, I think you will come to the same conclusion that I have. The remaining verses eliminate any doubt as to what animal this chapter is describing, and it's not a seropod dinosaur. In Job chapter 40, verses 21 and 22, we read, He lieth under the shady trees in the covert of the reed and fens. The shady trees cover him with their shadow. The original Hebrew word for shady tree is tishel. It is describing another tree native to Job's environment, the lotus tree. This tree is only mentioned in these two verses. It is commonly accepted by biblical scholars and scientists alike that this tree is the ancient Sisyphus lotus tree, which is included in about 40 species of small trees in the buckthorn family. Some of the trees in this family are deciduous, others are evergreen. The three well-known species are the jujube in southeastern Asia, the lotus from the Mediterranean region, and the bearer which is found from western Africa to India. The modern-day lotus tree growing in the Mediterranean area looks something like this. It reaches a height of no more than 30 feet tall and is close in shape and size to the lotus tree described in Job. The Brachiosaurus seropod stood 60 feet tall from ground to head. The Supersaurus seropod averaged a length of 108 to 112 feet long and stood 70 feet high from the ground to the head. The Amphicolius fragilimus species of the seropod grew to a length of 190 feet long and stood 90 feet high from ground to head. 
By comparison, the giraffe, the tallest of all living animals today, averages from 16 to 18 feet tall. In this demonstration, we are going to use the words of the young earth creationists to choose the dinosaur they say is described in Job chapter 40. Its bones are big, its body is big, I mean everything about that creature is big and it has an enormous tail as well. In fact it's the chief in the ways of God which means the largest land animal God made. That's what verse 19 really means. The largest of any dinosaur on earth stood approximately 90 feet tall. Let's take the lotus tree which grew to a height of 30 feet and place it next to that dinosaur. How in the world is the lotus tree going to cover him with their shadow? Even if the seropod dinosaur was laying down, it would be difficult to position itself under the lotus tree. On the other hand, you can find elephants, averaging about 12 feet tall, standing under trees all the time. It's a common habit of elephants to shade themselves from the hot sun. Another important point about the lotus tree is that it does not thrive in swamps. Although it does grow near rivers and streams, the root structure of this tree survives best in moderately moist soil, with the roots extending down as far as 30 feet into the ground to get its moisture. Lotus trees die if the ground they are on is flooded for an extended period of time. This fact conflicts with the assertion by young earth creationists that Bohemoth lives in a swamp. There is an effort to make young earthers believe that the words in the covert of the reed and fens prove that this animal lived in the swamp. Young earthers also point to the last part of verse 22 that says, the willows of the brook compass him about. The word brook comes from the Hebrew word nechal, which means a stream. By implication in this verse, in this context, it can also mean a narrow valley in which a brook runs. Taking verses 21 and 22, in their proper context, we are told that this animal spends time under lotus trees, which do not grow in swampy terrain, and that the animal spends time in stream. Again, we have the description of an elephant. Lecturers go to extraordinary effort to make their audiences believe that the reference to reed and fens and the willows of the brook are conveying the idea of a swamp. This is another young earth preconceived idea that the seropod dinosaur lived in the swamp. The followers of the young earth movement have fallen for this small amount of deceit because they haven't done their homework about elephants. Recent scientific discoveries about the elephant researchers shows that the elephant is unique among all mammals when it comes to the construction of their lungs. This unique construction is specifically designed by God to allow the elephant to thrive in water. This is the entire elephant lung here. Now it's very unusual because all other mammals have what's called a pleural space. When you expand your chest and breathe out and breathe in, the lung moves across that. Now the elephant's unusual in that you can see here what's left of it, these this firm fibrous attachments which cover the lung and attach it to the rib. This is what it would be like in the, in the live animal. And this is completely unique to the elephant. The lungs of most animals float in a fluid-filled cavity just below the ribs. But the elephant's lungs are physically glued to the ribs by a unique elastic connective tissue. This tissue is attached to muscles which when flexed inflate the lungs. No other mammal breathes like this. So why does the elephant have this type of system? There's a lot of theories on that. One of the original ones in the sort of 70s was that it was an adaption um, for being able to suck water up into the trunk. Um, so the pressure is generated in that. If you try sticking two hoses up your own nose and sucking water up, it's very, very difficult. However, new current thinking, and this is actually an adaptation to being able to swim and snorkel. In fact, scientists believe the elephant's ancestors relied on water to support their enormous bodies.
Even today, elephants are at home in the water. But there's another reason why elephants like to swim. It's a good way of keeping cool. Here is another televised special about the elephant that demonstrates the animal's love for water. In this National Geographic presentation, the researchers document the elephant's natural habitat and point out how water is a large part of an elephant's life. You know, elephants have all of the characteristics that we really admire. So they have that playfulness within them. They have a sense of mischief. Uh, you know, if you see elephants down at the waterhole flying around, you know, swimming around and splashing, that's just what they're doing, they're having fun. Some of this behavior is typical role-playing for young males, according to National Geographic grantee, Caitlin O'Connell Rodwell. You'll see a lot of young bulls kind of testing and experimenting uh, with other young bulls. They'll do what's called a pre-mount, where they'll take their trunk coming from the back of the other bull, lie it on the top of their back. So that would be called a pre-mount, and sometimes even put their front legs, stand up and mount the other young bull. But it's all in play and the other one will sort of run off and then they might do it again. And they will just lie in the water and let their trunk be as floppy as it possibly can be and just sort of flop it around and flop their whole bodies and their head and they'll spar. But then, a couple of the elephants did something that neither Caitlin nor I had ever seen before. They sat upright and begin slapping the water with their front legs and splashing themselves. The eternal dilemma, finding a way for humans and animals to coexist. Maybe one answer is to throw a few more pool parties like this one. Who wouldn't want to be neighbors with these guys? Folks, this is another compelling piece of evidence that the creature described in Job chapter 40, in the reed and fins, and surrounded by the willows of the brook, is none other than the elephant. But the bunch at Forbidden History and Kent Hoven will try to convince their followers that the verse is referring to a dinosaur in a swamp. The Bible says Behemoth lives under the shady trees, in the fens. The old English word fens means the swamp. Behemoth lives in the swamp. He lieth under the shady trees in the covert of the reed and fens. The shady trees cover him with their shadow. The willows of the brook compass him about. It sounds like he lives in the swamps. The young earth lecturers failed to tell their audiences that the elephant spends as much time in the swamp as than any other mammal on Earth. Verse 23 is another verse avoided by Ken Ham. This verse also describes an action taken by only one animal on the face of this earth, the elephant. The verse reads, Behold, he drinketh up a river, and hasteth not. He trusteth that he can draw up Jordan into his mouth. The key words in this verse are draw up. In the original Hebrew text, this term is giach. It is an action verb, and it means to labor to bring forth. In its simplest form, it can mean to come forth. In the context of this verse, used with the phrase into his mouth, this is describing the animal picking up water and placing it in its mouth. The animal does this with the use of a tool, his trunk. Young Earth teachers claim that this verse describes the river at the flood stage. And because the seropod dinosaur is so tall, it is confident it will survive even if a flood level reaches its mouth. This interpretation by young earthers is another attempt to fit their preconceived ideas into the biblical text. It is clear to any person who has any knowledge of the Hebrew language that the water in this verse is not rising on its own. The animal is causing the water to move up to its mouth. 
the term giak indicates that there is an effort on the part of the animal to cause this action. There would not be any effort on the part of the seropod to cause the river to rise. This verse specifically points out the effort on the part of the animal to draw up the water into its mouth. And because giach means to bring forth, this eliminates the possibility that this animal is simply drinking with its mouth. It's bringing up the water to its mouth to drink. This verse is describing an elephant. But let's say, for the sake of argument, that the young earthers are correct in their assertion that the scripture, he trusteth that he can draw up Jordan into his mouth, is referring to the dinosaur's confidence that he can survive during a flood. I think we've shown here that the elephant's unique lung construction and their ability to swim and play in water certainly makes the elephant a candidate for the young earthers interpretation also. The young narrator at Forbidden History has attempted to tackle verse 23, but as you'll see, his interpretation of this verse is severely distorted due to his lack of knowledge concerning the facts we have shown here. Behold, he drinketh up a river, and hasteneth not. He trusteth that he can draw up the Jordan into his mouth. So here we have an extremely large animal that eats grass like an ox, has a huge tail that looks like a cedar tree, lives in the swamps, and is so big that it can take up massive amounts of water in its mouth. There is no other animal that fits all the descriptions given here other than a dinosaur like the Diplodocus or Brachiosaurus. Now we come to the last verse in a description of Behemoth given to us in Job chapter 40. Not even the forbidden history narrator dares to mention this verse. If there is any doubt in your mind which animal is being described in Job chapter 40, verse 24 should convince you. This verse is avoided like the plague by young earth lectures. The verse reads, He taketh it with his eyes, his nose pierceth through snares. In the original text, the word nose is f, which means nostrils. The word pierceth comes from the Hebrew word nochab, it means to perforate, puncture, or to bore. There is one more important word in this verse. The word snare comes from the Hebrew word mochash. It is a trap for catching animals. If you compare the nose of an elephant with the nose of a seropod dinosaur, I think you'll agree that the description given in verse 24 fits an elephant and not a dinosaur. All you have to do is go to the zoo and you can see with your own eyes the elephant's nose piercing through snares. Is there any wonder why young earth lecturers stay as far away from this verse as they possibly can? The reason why Bible notes list an elephant as the creature described in Job chapter 40 is because until the young earth lecturers begin changing scripture, most Bible scholars agree that the animal was an elephant. Young Earth lecturers spend a great deal of time belittling godly Bible scholars who have studied God's Word their entire lives and have concluded that the animal described in Job chapter 40 is a modern-day elephant or hippopotamus. The reason hippopotamus was even considered is because of the animal's time spent in the water. Recent scientific discoveries about the elephant's anatomy and research uncovering the elephant's ability to swim has changed that idea. Yet young earthers continue to proclaim that they know more than these dedicated Bible scholars. And it's unfortunate. A lot of Bibles actually in the, in the footnotes, they'll say things like, you know, behemoth, have a little footnote, possibly an elephant or hippopotamus. But folks, something to remember, the footnotes in your Bible are not inspired. <laughs> something to remember. It's the text that's inspired. You know, before they put those comments at the bottom of the Bible, they really should be required to read the passage at least once. You know, before they comment on it, it's not an elephant hippo, hello. Now, I tell you what blows my mind. 
If you get some of the modern uh, Bibles and you look in their notes down the bottom, this is always a reminder, the notes are not inspired. The text is, right? And the text is a good commentary on the notes. But if you look in the notes, they say, behemoth, tail like a cedar. And down the bottom it says, probably hippopotamus or elephant. But see, I've still got a problem because some people really don't know exactly how to interpret this. And I want to ask you a question. How many people use a study Bible? I, I love my study Bible. It's got lots of cool stuff in it. But you know, there are kind of problems with study Bibles. And I want to kind of show you how it works. You see, study Bibles have got this line here. Now I want you to repeat after me. Above the line is God. Below the line is man. It's certainly not Christian-like to make fun of fellow Bible scholars. 2 Corinthians 1 and 17 says, When I therefore was thus minded, did I use lightness? Or the things that I purpose, do I purpose according to the flesh, that with me there should be yea, yea, and nay, nay? You know, before they put those comments at the bottom of the Bible, they really should be required to read the passage at least once. You know, before they comment on it. <laughs> it's not an elephant hippo, hello. Until young earthers came along and began modifying the very word of God, no one ever considered that Job 40 was describing a seropod dinosaur. What young earthers are trying to do here is to convince their audiences that they know more than extremely learned Bible scholars. I believe that Ken Ham, Kent Hoven, and every other young earth creationist took their preconceived ideas and blatantly modified and omitted scriptures so their verses fit the description of a dinosaur. Come on, folks. Do you mean to tell me that none of them are aware of verses 23 and 24? 2 Corinthians 4 and 1 says, Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not, but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully. The elephant is the world's largest land animal. Look at this beast. It truly is a behemoth. The scripture describing the bones are specifically describing elephant bones. Scripture never mentions a long neck or a huge tail that looks like a cedar tree. The elephant's tail moves or bends like the flexible Lebanese cedar tree. Even if the scripture did mention what the tail looked like, an elephant's tail looks exactly like a Lebanese cedar tree. A seropod dinosaur couldn't fit under a tree like the elephant. The elephant is at home in rivers and lakes and spends time in the swamp. The last two verses describe the animal drawing up water into its mouth and its nose piercing small openings are deliberately left out of most young earth lectures. I am basing all of my conclusions on the Word of God, not an idea conjured up by someone who believes dinosaurs lived with man and who wants scripture to fit into their preconceived ideas.